Kayvon, my man, long time yeah. coming, man. <laughs> yeah, long time. Way overdue, my man. Way overdue. Seriously. I mean, um, and thank you for, for taking your time. I know we've been trying to plan this for like three months. Um, <laughs> or because you the, made it. Or longer, longer, I think. Probably longer, right? Uh, yeah. No, we took, like, for the podcast, we took a little break for a little bit of time before when I asked you, and then, like, I picked it up again. Um, but you made a huge move, which I want to get to in the podcast, but, like, obviously, I want folks to, to know who you are, um, kind of get a little bit of your story. I know a little bit about your story, but I'd love to hear more about Kayvon, how you grew up, who, who you are, your career journey, and where it's led to you now. Um, and I think we can start from there, but yeah, yeah, I think we need to learn more about Kayvon and who he is. <laughs> yeah, man, man I mean, that's a lot. Um, I'm like, where do I start? So my name is Kayvon Tucker. Uh, I'm a father. I am a husband. I'm a brother, friend. Uh, I'm also a leadership coach. I'm a business leader. I, I and my wife co-founded this company called Consciously where we're centered on helping people and leaders learn more about themselves. Um, Cause we believe that as you learn more about who you are and you find and fulfill your purpose, you create more positive good uh, in this world. You, know, you make, create more positivity for yourself and the people around you. So I spend my days coaching leaders um, in different companies, different industries, different types of organizations. Uh, to help them become more conscious of who they are and what they want to do with their time on this planet. Um, my background is in psychology. So I went to undergrad in psychology, got my bachelor's in psych, and then got my master's in industrial organizational psychology. You know, my first big boy job was in learning and development. <laughs> um, and I've been in that space ever since. And the coaching thing that I'm doing now is really like an evolution of that. Uh, Prior to that, I grew up in Anaheim, California. So I've lived in Southern California most of my life. Um, prior to that, lived in Kansas. I uh, was born in Wichita, Kansas. Grew up in a little suburb called Derby, Kansas. So I spent the first seven years of my life there um, growing up outside, which is part of the reason why I came to Costa Rica is to get back outside. That's so important to me. Um, so yeah, so that's a bit of my journey. I mean, I could definitely go deeper in any one of those areas, but that's that's a part of part of my journey. Yeah, so at, at what age did you uh, train, you know, move out of Wichita, Kansas to to California, right? Like that was your Yeah, yeah, I was 7. I was 7 okay. years old. So my young. mom, yeah, I was pretty young. My mom moved us out of Kansas cuz she wanted more for us and she yeah. also wanted us to be in like a more diverse area. Um, so she moved us to Anaheim, which wasn't really more diverse. Uh, Anaheim, I don't know if you know much about Anaheim, or at least North Anaheim where I grew up. But it was like 99% um, Latin Americans who lived there and like mostly Mexican folks I lived. So it was like I went from living in a mostly white neighborhood to a mostly Mexican neighborhood. So not much more diverse, <laughs> but at least more people of color. Uh, and I appreciated that. I appreciated living around people of color. Um, so it was nice to grow up in that kind of environment. Um, and how so long were you in yeah. Anaheim? I was in Anaheim for 14 years. So 14 years, from, wow. from seven to 21. So that's, that's really like where I grew up, grew up. You know, I went to, went to high school there, started college there, and I didn't leave Anaheim until I got into grad school. And then when wow. I started going to grad school, I moved to Long Beach where I was going to grad school. Yeah, and I guess when you were, uh, growing up at Anaheim, was there anything that really like stuck out to, you You know, people are usually nostalgic about the places you you live in, right? Like, was there anything in like TV or or shows or anything you see now that's like, oh, that's, that's what I miss about home, my, my, my Uh, home, you know, that I lived so many years in. uh, Not really, bro. Uh, (laughs) I appreciate that question. You know, I grew up down the street from Disneyland, which has its pros and cons. Um, it was nice to have access to that place, right? But when you live that so close, like going to Disneyland is you know, it's kind of lame, you know. It's like, oh, that's what everybody does. Um, so it wasn't really that special. I used to, for years. So nine was it nine thirty p.m. every night? Disneyland has the fireworks. 
Oh, um, I could see them. I can see them from my apartment balcony, which was pretty cool. But then after a little while, you're like, all right, I'm tired of seeing these damn fireworks, <laughs> you, you know? Um, and then after I left, after I left Anaheim, I like my internal clock knew when it was 930. Like, it was like I would look at the clock and it would be 930. Like I could always feel 930 because of having grown up down the street from Disneyland and the fireworks going off at 930 every night. So no, I don't really miss Anaheim that much. Um, <laughs> it was a, it was a, you know, Anaheim was an okay place to grow up. Um, not there's, there's, there's a lot there. There's like history there. Um, right. But what I appreciate most about growing up in Anaheim was where I went to high school and the people right. that I met, my boys, like my boys for life. I met them in high school in Anaheim. Right. I went to a really oddly diverse high school um academics were okay sports were okay but it was super diverse and that's like one of the most important things to me now and always has been is really appreciate growing up and going to such a diverse high school and that diversity i guess stuck with you throughout your life is something that you've sought correct i mean based on like our conversations and stuff yes, absolutely i mean you saw that you you and i we had dinner the other day you saw how diverse that group of folks was exactly. um and i i that's what's important i love to be around people who are different people yeah. who come from different walks of life or doing different things have different stories different journeys that that's really important to me and did I, and correct me if i'm wrong you grew up with siblings or you, you're not you're so yeah I, I, no i have an older sister I have an have older, older sister. Yes. Yeah, she's three years older than me. And and then I know we spoke, grew up in a single father household. I think that's how we connected, like very yeah. deeply, because we were like, oh, we're both kind of like single mother household. Sorry, I said single father. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> single father. That's tough. That's tough. Tough. You know, single that's mother tough. household. Yeah, <laughs> single father. Woo. No, we yeah, we both grew up in single mother households. Um, my dad was never really in my life. Yeah. He was around i would talk to him every once in a while but he and my mom split at when i was like one years old so actually i don't know if i you know this but i lived in spain as a baby um yeah as a baby when i was like one years old my mom and my dad moved my all of us to spain so my dad was in the military and so i lived there for the first year of my life my mom tells me that I used to understand Spanish fluently or fully. Obviously, I was a baby, so I couldn't speak it. But I used to understand it. Um, but that didn't work out for them. So my mom came back to the States. My dad stayed in Spain uh, for his tour of duty. And they never got back together. And from the time of like one to, I don't want to say like nine, I had never actually met, met him. I didn't meet him for the first time until I was nine years old. Wow. And then... I didn't see him again until I was 15. He came out from my sister's high school graduation and that was it. That was the last time I ever saw him. So I talked to him every once in a while. He passed when I was 21. So never really got to know the guy. And how was that experience? I mean, obviously I've talked about my own experience in the, in, on the podcast of growing up with a single mother household and like, you know, I, and I think we spoke about this where like, I'm, I'm grateful that my father is in my life now, but like growing up without that is definitely, I definitely felt something missing for quite a while. Like there was this hole in my heart. Was yeah. there any feeling like that for you? Or did you find that elsewhere? Like, what was that for you? Uh, you know, I don't think I was really aware. Mm -hmm. It definitely impacted me. You know, I've done a lot of healing around yeah. my father wound. Um, so I, now I'm aware of how it impacted me, but growing up, I didn't really know, you know, and I grew up like all my boys grew up in single mother households, uh, with the exception of one. Um, and so we all had like the same things going on. So it was kind of normal, <laughs> you know, we were all just like, this is, this is just this life, is right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah this, this is how we live. This is how we are, um, with all of our, our father wounds and mother wounds that we hadn't yeah. healed. Um, so it was okay. But as I look back, I know that I was very angry as a kid. I had a lot of anger. I didn't know what to do with it. You know, I got, I got in fights. I got arrested as a teen. Um, you know, I'm like, a, I was a good kid, but somehow I got myself arrested <laughs> um, when I was like 13 years old for fighting. Um, so it's like that kind of stuff. So I didn't know how to deal with it. I didn't know how to process. You know, my dad would like make, make promises like, oh yeah, I'm gonna come see you and then not keep them. 
or he would say, I'm going to call you and then not call, you know, so that stuff hurt as a kid, but I just, as a kid, I like tried to act like I was brushing it off, but really I was really angry uh, for Uh a long time. And I, this is a great question too, because I think like there's something about folks that like, even now I have that thing of like, if someone tells me they're going to do something and do it, it like, it doesn't upset me anymore. Cause it's like, it's been, you know, so many times that that's happened. And I don't know if that's something that you just get used to, like, especially if your father is doing that, you know, like, you know, my sister's father was my stepfather, for instance. And he did that a lot where he would be like, I'm going to take you guys to Disneyland in Florida. You know, we were kids. Of course we want to go to Disney, but like it never happened. Or he'd tell us, oh, I can't, I'm going to take you here to the Bronx Zoo, you know, growing up in New York City. Never yeah. had that happen. You know, like all these things. And like, as we age, I guess, I don't know how that shows up. And I don't, I'm curious to learn from you, like how that showed up for you, what kind of work you've done for that and of hearing that a lot growing up, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, what I, what I know for myself is that I had a really big, uh, people pleaser saboteur. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was like my way of kind of dealing with not just like the stuff with my dad, but also stuff with my mom, you know, Mm -hmm. me just doing whatever I can to make people happy. So I figure like, as, as long as I can like make people happy and they'll continue to love me. Right. Obviously I could only do so much with my dad because he was just wasn't, wasn't around ever. Um, but even with my mom, I just tried my best to, to like, just make people happy. Uh, so yeah. when people now today, when, when people don't follow through, I know that it says more about them than it right. says anything about me. Like if somebody mm-hmm. doesn't do what they say they're going to do, um, I don't really take offense. You know, that's a part of the healing. I used to be like, oh man, they don't like me. What did I do? What's wrong with me? Um, that this person is not doing what they said they were going to do. And I, I would always make it about me, right? right. Um, like I was wrong or I somehow did something wrong. I pushed people away or something like that. Uh, now it's like, oh no, if it's on them, right? Say somebody says they're going to do something, they don't do it. That's on them. And I don't really judge that because I also understand it, you know? Yeah, yeah. I get I guess it's still, I still have trouble with it. Like I've worked on it, but like occasionally depending on the person, it might like still like hit me in a way that's like, oh, you know, yeah. like, I, I, I feel that, you know, I, so my wife has helped me with this. So my wife, she has a different attachment style than okay. I do. So she's right. really comfortable just kind of doing her own thing. Yeah. And so in setting boundaries, so she's helped me with that. Right. Where now it's like, if I don't want to do something, even though I may have committed to doing it, I just won't do it. Uh, I'm now I'm in a, I'm in a phase now where I'm like pretty comfortable not doing things that I don't want to do. Yeah. And if I'm not feeling it, it happens to be the day, right? It's like the day of something like this doesn't feel right for me. I just let the person know like, Hey, this doesn't feel right for me. I still want to do it. But like today's not the day. And that, does rub some people the wrong way you know like if you want let's say like you and i want to have a podcast together or 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 we're just trying to set up a meeting together i i know the number of times i might reschedule something pisses some people off i get that right at the same time i'm a busy person and i also respect other people who are busy so like right. if somebody reschedules on me a whole bunch of times, I don't take that personally. I'm just like, wow, that person must be really busy. And that's cool. It's cool that like they're that booked up. And, you know, this thing that we want to do together will happen when it needs to happen, when it's right. Um, and I trust that that person who I'm supposed to do something with, who mm-hmm. keeps rescheduling on me, won't do it if they don't want to do it. They'll let me know, right. like, actually, this doesn't work for me anymore and just cancel. And that'll be fine, too. Um, so it's all good. But that's. It's been a journey for me right. to get to that place. It's been years of healing for me to get to a place where I'm okay with canceling on people and okay being canceled on. Ooh, and I feel like I, and maybe it's, I don't know if it's like a cultural thing with the West and East Coast type of stuff, but like, you know, coming from the East Coast, I've been able to see like, yeah, New York people, you know, they're going to cancel on you last minute because everyone's so busy in New York City. And then over here, it's like they don't really cancel on you. They just kind of like don't say anything at least that's been my experience and you're like 
we were supposed to do this thing and then they like let you know like a minute beforehand and you're like what at least in new uh, york people let me know like the morning of or whatever the case may be so i don't know if it's like a yeah <laughs> it's, you know i hear that too I, mean, I don't know a lot of new yorkers my my actually my family's from new york so i i have parts of that in me um but i know that West Coast folks can be a little more laissez-faire yes. about their calendars. <laughs> We're just a little more relaxed, like, oh, it's all good. It'll get done. So I, I've been on the West Coast most of my life. So very, I'm, very, I'm very West Coast in some ways. Very West Coast, yeah. yeah. I, I, yeah. I feel like we need to be more like that anyway. And, like, I've gotten better living here for the last three years. But, like, you know, my New Yorker comes out occasionally and be like, why didn't you let me know this morning? Like, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But not, not, not as much as, I guess, three years ago, you know, like I've gotten used to it and been like, you know what, like, you know, like if we reschedule, like I don't get that way with you, for instance, I know you're a father, you have a business, like, I'm like, I totally can see myself in his position and be like, hey, like when you have the time, you know, I'm open to it. Hey, I, I, I don't have kids, right? I don't have a business, like, you know, like, so yeah. I get it, you know, and yeah, I, well, I, I wish more people could do that. I appreciate that, Grace. Um, I, I really do. You know, I said we, so. Just let's let's be transparent. We were supposed to record this yesterday, and oh, yeah. I, yeah. And I was like, but I hit you up in the morning, right? I hit you, you up in the morning. I was like, not today. We'll do it tomorrow. And here we are. Here we yeah. are. So it's all it good. works out. It's just it's like you good. know, we when we had dinner a, a few weeks back, it was the same thing. Like I remember, we reached out and like we should hang. We should hang. And it was just like, hey, it happened when it was supposed to happen. And, you know, we ended up having dinner. Um, you know, it was so great to see you and the family and, like, meet yeah, other people in your network. It was amazing, you know. So I think there's something about, like, letting time or, like, the universe or whatever you believe in, like, just take the reins for a little bit. I mean, like, it, it's not supposed to happen right now. It's cool. You can't force it. You can't exactly. force it. You get an invitation. You can show up or not show up. Either way, it's okay. Exactly, exactly. But um, I definitely wanted to talk basically like how you grew up. You ended up going into like the business world. And like usually guys like us, like statistically, it it's very rare. Like even yeah. the book that I'm reading right now of Boys and Men, he has a whole chapter on like black men and, you know, being a black man. Like the stacks are even more against black men than any other race in America based on like what he's talking about in the book, the data he's using it. Like, like the other day I was reading it and it, it made me emotional because, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of my friends growing up in Coney Island were black guys and I was really close. Like I'm very still have many black friends and I'm like, damn, like it's, it's so sad um, that all these, whether that's the policies and all these things like created that, like and and push these guys but you like when i look at your linkedin i'm just blown away and i'm like oh man mm -hmm. like kayvon has done so well in his life mm, but thank you man you know like i'm always i'm curious to hear like how you were able to like get into the big companies like the amazon the netflix the google and kind of like take your career like really catapult up there to the point that mm. you, i mean you have your own business now but I love to hear like your career journey and like how yeah. you were able to like break through all of that. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's a wild journey. Um, <laughs> so I'll start with I'll start with my education. Mm. So I went and got so I went from bachelor's in psych to master's in industrial organizational psychology, and I only did that because. I, at the time, you know, I was like 21, 22, mm -hmm. thinking about what's next. And I was a peer advisor and peer advisors did research and shared the research with other psych students to help them make career moves. So I had access oh. to like a lot of information about careers for psych students. And in that, I learned that like, if you have a bachelor's in psychology, like you're not gonna make any money, you know, like the job market is really tough. And so, I started thinking, well, shit, I got to do something else. Um, and I was about to graduate in 2008, which, you know, we all know was this huge recession. So I was like, well, shit, it's like job prospects not looking very prom promising. So why don't I just keep my ass in school? But like what school? Right. So I looked at things that were important to me. So I looked at um, being a social worker. I talked to social workers. They all seemed miserable. So I was like, maybe not that. 
Um, I decided to marry one. But that's a whole other story. Um, <laughs> I talked to therapists, like clinical psych, counseling psych folks, and they seemed like they liked their jobs. They liked the work. It was rewarding, but I wasn't really interested in going back to school for five years. I'm like, mm, I don't know about that. And I don't really know about being somebody's therapist because I still had healing to do. And I, 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 I wasn't super aware of all the healing I needed to do, but I knew that I was in no way, shape or form ready to be somebody's therapist. I'd right. never been to therapy myself. So like that didn't even make sense. Um, so I was like, what are the other options? And I, I stumbled into this area called industrial organizational psychology. My school at Cal State Long Beach actually had a master's program in it. So I went and talked to some of the professors of, of it and they shared with me like, yeah, one, like they're the highest paid psych folks. So I was like, okay, check mark. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in my early twenties, like give me some money. Um, <laughs> and then I learned that a part of the field, you could get into learning and development where it was called training and development at the time. And I loved learning. I, in undergrad, I took a class in learning. It was like all about the brain and how learning works. And I was fascinated with learning. Um, so I was like, oh, I can help people learn. I mean, with helping people learn, learn more about themselves or learn how to pick up new skills to help their careers and help them be better at their jobs, help people work better together. I was like, oh, that's it. Like, that's what I want to do. So I knew going into the program that learning and development was like what I wanted to do. So I just like had to do all the other things was like get all those tools. But really, I was like, I'm going to get a job in learning development. So I did. And I got my first big boy job at Southern California Edison and doing training program analysis. So really, it was like I was taking data from training. You know, you take a survey after you go right. through a training. I was a person that was analyzing the data to see how effective the training was and whether how to make the training better, which was like a really cool place to start my career in learning and development because now I fully understand what makes learning and development effective. Right. Um, so I did that for like a year, got you know promoted to training program manager, and then I started managing people who were training program managers. So just kind of continued to grow and progress. And then I got back into like learning evaluation, but on a broader scale. So I was doing all this stuff kind of getting further and further away from what I really wanted to do, which was right. actually helping people learn, but I was still in the space. But it was when I, I, I woke up one day and I was miserable. You know, I was like, basically I was depressed. I didn't know it. I didn't have the language, but it was like really hard for me to get out of bed. There was org changes going on at work. And I'd been at the job for like five years at this point. And it was like already time for me to like go. I never, I said I wasn't going to stay there longer than five years. And here five years came and now I'm miserable at my job. I'm miserable in my life. And I'm like, I need to do something. Um, my wife, my now wife was trying her best to help me. She couldn't really be my therapist, even though she was, you know, wanting to be a therapist. So she's like, I think you need to talk to somebody. So I did. I went and found my therapist who I still see today. So we're going on wow. like, I don't know, eight, nine years together. Um, super dope dude. Uh, he's like been a surrogate father to me. But anyways, mm -hmm. um, so I went to therapy and it was through therapy that I started one to heal. You know, I started to learn more about who I am and what's important to me. And it was like through those conversations that I got clear that human connection was what was missing for me. Oh. Right. And like the job that I was doing was in learning and development, but I was like just looking at data and I was managing people. I was so far removed from the actual learning process that it just wasn't. It wasn't, it didn't feel meaningful. It didn't feel purposeful. So I was spending my days doing shit that didn't mean anything to me. Right. Um, so I started to dabble in different things. Um, I started to facilitate manager and leadership development workshops at this place. And I love that. Um, I was like, oh, this is it. I was in a facilitating a workshop on like manager communication or supervisor mm -hmm. communication. And really it was like helping managers connect better to themselves and connect better to the people that they report to or the people that report to them. And I just love being in the classroom and facilitating and seeing light bulbs and seeing connection happen. I was like, Oh, this is, this is it. Like I'm finding, I'm finding like a part of my purpose, at least, uh, never felt more alive at work than when I was facilitating. And so I did that for a little bit, you know, half day workshop. This is all off the side of my desk. I still have my full-time job, but I was like volunteering to facilitate. 
So I do a half day workshop and then that grew into a full day workshop. Full day workshop grew into a two day workshop or two day program. Two day program turned into a five day program. So next thing you know, I'm like not a full time facilitator, but I am like facilitating a lot. And one of the people I was learning how to facilitate from said, Hey, Kayvon, the way you facilitate is very coach like. Have you ever been through coaching training? And I'm like, nah, what's coaching? He's like, okay, uh, go through CTI fundamentals and call me in the morning. So I found the course. I did that. And I walked out of that three day training feeling like I had really found my life purpose. Wow. And so is at that point I'm at this place, my full, my day job. I'm not really appreciate, not, not really loving. I don't feel supported. Um, I'm trying to make change in my career, but they're like, no, Kayvon, we need you to stay in your lane kind of thing. Um, so I just start like hooking my LinkedIn up, making myself visible. Um, I start, you know, I go to the gym, I'm like getting my mind right. I'm reading books, you know, I'm doing all the things to like prepare myself for whatever's next. I didn't know what was next, but I was preparing myself for whatever's next, getting clear on my mission and vision. Jess and I founded conscious helpers, which is the original name of our business. Um, so I started this business with no clients, but I knew that I needed a channel for this important work and manager leadership development and coaching leadership coaching. Um, so I had a business, no clients. I had my body, right. Mind, right. I healed, did a lot of healing for like two years. And then one day, um, out of nowhere, Netflix emails me and I'm like, I, I, I still remember the day I got the email and I thought it was like spam or like, <laughs> Or like a phishing email or something. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, uh, I tell Jess, I'm like, I got this email. It's from somebody at Netflix, and they're saying they want to talk to me about a job. I'm like, should I respond? And <laughs> Jess is like, Yeah, you better respond. And I'm like, Well, why are they emailing me? You know, I'm just this dude. I worked at Southern California Edison. I got my bachelor's, master's. You know, I got. I got I've done work, but like I work at this little company. Like, why does what does Netflix want with me? Um, so I ended up responding. Obviously, you know, the rest of the story goes. I got the job amazingly. Ended up working at Netflix, doing manager and leadership development, but also doing some of the old stuff that I was doing, which was a great, great like segue into the work that I really wanted to be doing. Mm-hmm. Doing that job opened me up to be able to work for Amazon. So Amazon ended up hitting me up saying, oh, I see you're doing some manager and leadership development stuff. Do you want to come do that full time? And I'm like, well, hell yeah. Um, <laughs> sign, like sign me up for that. So I went and got to work for AWS and facilitating manager and leadership development across the globe. Like I was facilitating and helping leaders at like manager level, director level, VP level, learn how to be better wow. leaders. And all the while I'm learning how to be a better leader, but I had been reading these books too prior to. So I like had a, a lot of knowledge, but I didn't have a lot of practice on like, how do you be a good leader? Um, but I was facilitating that, which was super cool. So I did that for like a year and a half. And by the time I was getting tired of being on airplanes, um, uh-huh. and facilitating in the classroom all the time, I wanted to start designing. I wanted to start doing my own thing. Uh, Google hit me up and Google was basically like, Kayvon, we see what you're doing at Amazon. It sounds like you're doing a really big scale. Do you want to do something similar, but run your own shop on a smaller scale and support this staffing organization? I'm like, 100%. Um, (laughs) Google was actually the place that I always wanted to work. Like when I left Southern California Edison, it was on a mission to work for Google. And so now Google is finally calling me saying, do you want to come work for us? And I'm like, yeah, 100%. So I went and did that. And I did that for almost four full years and I ran my own shop um, supporting the staffing organization at Google, um, setting strategy for managers and leaders, uh, designing programs, running programs, um, job, jobs of a lifetime. Never imagined I'd be doing these kind of things. And I'm just, I'm a little black kid from Anaheim, you know, or a little black kid from Derby, Kansas. Um, so I was getting into these spaces was, it's kind of crazy. Still, I look back and I'm like, I still can't really believe that this was my career journey. It's wild, um, but I feel super, super fortunate because getting these opportunities open it up so like I could get the clients that I have now and run the business that I have now. So I probably wouldn't have the business that I have now if I hadn't worked for these places, you know? Um, So 
I'm super grateful for, for these experiences. And what I'm, what I hear is just, you were just following a purpose and you were just like, like getting guided in a sense. I don't know if you did any like, you know, uh, intention vision board stuff or like any of you know, that. I did. I did actually. One thing I did. So I, I read the seven habits of highly effective people right. and I was like reading all the books. I read that book early on, like back before I got any of these opportunities and I crafted my first version of like my personal mission statement. You know, that's mm -hmm. one of the exercises in the book. And I did that. I like went to a beach and I like wrote it out. Um, and I, I firmly believe getting that clarity is mm -hmm. what helped me because like it just made it like when Netflix hit me up, it was like, yeah, that direction. It's not exactly what you know you want, but it's closer. And then mm -hmm. Amazon was like, not exactly what you want, but it's closer. And then Google was like, this is what you said you wanted. You know, it's not perfect, but this is what you said you wanted. So I had to check it out at the very least. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a trip how that kind of stuff can can help you along your journey. Yeah, but just writing it down, I think clarity, I think so many people are like, don't think, especially like I talked to a lot of young people, obviously, you know, when we met, I was working at year up and training young folks. And that's something that they never really had. And I would be like, have you sat down and like thought about what you actually want to do? Because every time I ask, especially a young man, right? Like a young man, you'd be like, what do you want to do? I don't know. Right. And it's just like, well, have you sat down and tried to think through it? Or like, what have you tried that really brings you alive? Because it hmm. seems like you did something to find like what brought you alive, whether that was, that was taking 100%. a class, right? Like taking a class yeah. in college. Yeah. Just dipping. Well, it was it, taking a class. I knew learning. I, I loved learning. Yeah. And then I got into facilitation. I was like, Oh, I like this. And then facilitation or manager and leadership development facilitation led me to coaching. And I was like, Oh, that's even better. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm like, yeah, so that's it. Like facilitation and coaching, like this is it. So I just kept, you know, following what felt good. And then here That's we amazing. are. Damn. Damn and, and you're doing consciously now. Like, I think like what I've seen you doing, like, I haven't seen you like in the midst of coaching yet. You know, I would love to, whenever you throw your big events, bro, cause I know that's going to happen in the future. <laughs> it's going to happen. I, I can't wait to go and like watch you in your, in your element. You know what I mean? But like you've been doing consciously for a few years now, but now like this has finally become your full-time thing, right? Yeah, man. Yeah. I, yeah. Like this... what's that like for you? It's, you know, when you ask, it makes me like really be with it. Mm. It's, it's wild. It's, it's like a wild dream, mm. you know, that I'm just kind of moving through. And it's, it's very similar to this stuff with these jobs. Right. Um, the opportunities that are coming to me are things I never imagined would happen. Wow. You know, I'm, I'm only able to do this because some opportunities came to me and said, Hey, Kayvon, you said you wanted to be a full-time coach. So here's an opportunity for you to be a full-time coach. Do you want it? <laughs> and I'm like, well, yeah. Um, you know, uh, Jess and I, when we started this business, it was called conscious helpers. And we always had this idea of having a collective. A collective of coaches and counselors to help make this positive change in the world. So we know we can't do it ourselves. And similar thing, something we stated we wanted, then we have opportunities come to us and say, hey, this thing you said you wanted is here now. Do you still want it? And we're like, yeah, so we're going for it. So it's wild, man. Um, this is why I do this work. I, I, I do this work. I built this business because I want other people to experience what I've experienced, mm. which is like my whole purpose is around you becoming more powerful, uh, a more powerful attractor when you are on purpose. When you're on purpose, you attract all the things that you want. Um, and I want other people to be living in that way. So much of it is to your point is like just getting clear on who you are and what you want. And, and based on like how I experience you whenever we talk, it's like you're so chill and relaxed. Like, you know, I've met people in my life who are like, they want to do something and they're going so hard at the paint and it's just not happening versus how I experience you. And like, every time I'm in your presence, I fear you're just like, like a Buddhist monk, just sitting there, just <laughs> allow, allowing everything to just come to you. And you're just like, yeah, I'll do that. 
sure, I'll do that. Instead of this whole, like, you know, westernized thinking of, like, I need to go mm. hard in the paint. I need to work super hard. I need to, like, you know, basically kill myself in a sense um, and work 80-hour weeks, sacrifice sleep, sacrifice family time, like, all these things versus, like, I mean, I don't know. Maybe you haven't told us, like, the hard work no. you put behind the, the game, but... Well, I, I, I have a lot of uh, reps. I have a lot of reps. And when mm. I say reps, I mean, like, I've put in a lot of work. Like, I did get yeah. my bachelor's. I did get my master's. I did work my ass off. I worked myself to the bone to the point where I was suicidal, oh. right? Okay. And then that was the turning point. It's like, I did that. I did that, and I saw where it got me. And I'm like, okay, well, that's obviously not the path. So, like, what is the path? And the path for me is now is purpose. Right. But what, what comes with purpose when you when you know you're on your path is trust and faith and surrender. Mm. Right. When you know you're on your path, like you allow the world, the universe, God, source, consciousness, whatever you want to call it, you allow it to give you what you want. And then you just have to take steps forward. There is still taking steps forward. Right. Like nothing that you want happens without you moving, but you don't need the grind, right? right. Um, I did that and it, it almost killed me. And so that's no longer what I'm moving towards. I'm moving towards faith, purpose, fulfillment, and just following all of that. And that is a lot more easeful. Mm. Um, it's a lot more easeful path. It's the more sustainable path. You know, it's, nothing's easy, right? I moved to Costa Rica. That was not easy. Um, but it wasn't, I wasn't out of like, I wasn't doing this out of lack or right. scarcity. I was doing yeah. this to follow something that I felt called to follow. Um, so it's a very different kind of, kind of journey. And why do you think we as a society currently still think that that old way, like you said, you worked yourself to the point, to the point that you got suicidal, which is very common, um, you know, men experience suicide three times more than women unfortunately and it's mostly yeah. middle middle aged men it's very very sad i mean when i'm reading this data and again it makes me super emotional because i'm like shit like i'm getting to that midlife stage where i'm like what if that happens to me you know like i don't know it could yeah. um but like why do you think we still think that 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 works and instead of yeah. listening to people like you yeah well can't. first of all it's not gonna happen to you because you're mm. aware and you know what leads people down that path. So mm. you would have to like do something in spite of yourself <laughs> to, to some, you, don't, you don't just like wake up depressed. Like, you know, unless right, right. you're completely unaware, like I was when I was like in my mid twenties, right? Neither of us are there anymore. Maybe right. something happens in your life that knocks you down. That's hard to get back up from that can still happen. Um, but you're not going to work yourself to death because you know where that gets you. So let's just, let's just put that out there. Um, <laughs> but why don't other people, I think it's just lack of knowledge of self, mm -hmm. you know, it's a lack of consciousness. Um, it's people using force instead of using their own power. That's like force takes energy, power gives energy. And mm -hmm. so it's people expending all of their energy to try to make something happen instead of using their per personal purposeful power to, uh, to allow things to come into their lives. And then all they have to do is say, yes, and I'm going to move forward. Um, so it's the, it's the work, it's the inner work. Anybody who's running themselves into the ground, um, doesn't know themselves very well, right? So it's like, when you know yourself well, you treat yourself well you love yourself well and you don't do things that tear you down you do things that build you up right and i think back to when i was in my early mid-20s i was doing a lot of things that were tearing me down i was drinking right. i wasn't i wasn't exercising i was working way too much i was doing the 60 hours sometimes more um you know staying out late with my boys like doing all sorts of wild stuff that tore my body down tore my mind down tore my spirit down um, now I don't right now. It's like, Oh, I have a podcast with Ruben and really what would be most fulfilling for me is to spend time with my family. So I'm gonna reschedule with Ruben, Ruben, right. right? Um, cause that's what's best for me. 
and we'll right. save it for the next day. And if that doesn't work, then we'll make it work some other day. Right? It's making those little decisions day by day, moment to moment, the things that best serve you is what leads you down this path. Doing the things that serve other people is what leads you down the other path. Oof, oof. So it's like thinking of yourself before thinking of other people. I mean, it's the whole analogy of the airplane, right? The mask on first before 100%. you can, can't put 100%. the other people's mask on. And it's like, I guess, how do folks know? Like, that they feel when they need to follow a specific path or know that, I know if I do that, it's not going to lead me to where I want to be. So I need to do that. But like, because most people are probably people pleasers and they want they don't want to look bad, why do we continue yeah. to throw ourselves into those things? It's a lot, you know, so this is the stuff I coach people around. Um, mm. uh, there's a model that I use called positive intelligence. It's just a framework for thinking about this stuff. Mm -hmm. And we all have these things called saboteurs. And our saboteurs are our fear-driven expressions of our ego, essentially. So one of them is a pleaser. One of them is hyper achiever. One of them is controller. One of them is stickler or like your perfectionist. One of them is a victim, right? And there's nine of these things and they're all based on fear of some, some sort. So fear is what ends up killing us. Fear is what drives us into the ground. Fear is what keeps us stuck in the same job or in the same relationship that we don't need to be in. It's fear is like, the number one thing that holds people down um, and it just has all these different expressions. So pleaser is my top saboteur. It's not my mm -hmm. only one, but it's my top one. And there are a lot of people who have people pleasers, but there's hyper achievers, right? Um, there's people who like just love getting shit done and they do so much that they end up running themselves into the ground. Um, you know, there's the controller. The controller like feels like they need to make sure everything goes just the way that they want to and they need to have control um, and that ends up stressing them out right? right so there's all these different ways that people sabotage themselves and keep themselves from doing what they say they want to do or what's really important to them but it's all fear all boils down to that one thing man uh, <laughs> it's, it's like <laughs> a lot of it does man a lot, it's a big thing and that's the thing that's tough when you live in these societies where you're just having fear pumped into you every day, right. it's really hard to combat that. That's the challenge. That's what we're up against is these systems that are really want us to stay stuck. They want us to, to keep doing what they want us to do instead of what we want to do for ourselves. Um, but that's the work that me and my clients do is like working through that, navigating through that so we can be more of ourselves and less of our saboteurs. Oof. And it's, it's funny that you mentioned that because like the other week I, I wrote a, uh, like a blog article about like things I've learned from just watching my dog. Like I got a dog mm. three months ago um, and I've seen the things that he fears and like scares mm. him. Right. But what I thought about was not only like the obviously there's the fear that's very like you can see it. Right. Like he'll jump at like a quick sound, you know, a bike passes by. He'll be like, oh, crap. Right. Yeah. But the, to me, what I've also found through watching him and experiencing his experience is these underlying like unconscious fears that probably exist in our body. And I think of, you know, I live in a downtown area. I'm like all these noises that happen. Like, I'm like, I'm an animal, like I'm human, but I'm an animal deep down. Like, how is this affecting me in ways that I'm not seeing? And I have to be conscious of that. And, you know, obviously you moved to Costa Rica. Like, I'm like, Oh crap. Like this, you are, I think doing, where the future is going, where we need to go back to kind of like, hey, that city life, I don't think it's meant for humans. <laughs> like, I don't think it was meant for us to be on top of each other, all this noise happening all the time. No, like <laughs> man, I, I, I firmly, yeah, it's, um, it, I'll say this, it's more than we need. Cities mm. are a representation of like more than we need, right? Cities are good places to congregate, good places to like do commerce, um, and collaborate, but not good places to live right. full time. It's not good for us. Anybody who becomes aware of themselves and their bodies and their energy, being in a city is just going to be overwhelming, yeah. right? So as you become more conscious, you become more sensitive, 
<laughs> right? Um, so you're like, oh man, I can feel this person's energy. It's like it's not my energy. And then when you're in a city, you got you got everybody's energy that you're mixing with. Um, and when you're in a place like Oakland or San Francisco or New York or Los Angeles, like you name a city, um, there's a lot of people's energies you don't want to be mixed up with, right? And it has a huge impact on you. Um, versus like being out in nature. Like I know you like to get outside. You like, you know what it's, what it's like to get outside. It's healing. Um, so it's like, what would it be like for all of us to be able to just be in those healing environments, live in those healing environments all the time versus living in these environments where that are doing damage to our bodies, our minds, our spirits, um, taking away from our like pure essence. Um, so yeah, it's a, uh, I don't know the future, what the future holds. I would have a hard time seeing the city living, holding right. up. Um, maybe it'll come back around at some point, but right now people are leaving cities. People will continue to leave cities for the foreseeable future and we'll see where that takes us. But you, I feel like you already like saw something ahead that you're like, I need to leave the States and move to Costa Rica, which when I first found out, I was like, you're doing exactly like how I vision like myself, right? Like I was just like, oh crap, Kayvon's already like do actually doing it, like actually <laughs> going and picking up like the courageous act of just being like, I know my friends and family are all here, but I need to like think about my future family and, and, and what they're going to like yeah. experience. Right. Yeah. And just to do that, like, I don't know, like what. I know we talked about it, but I'd love to, you know, yeah. revisit that conversation. Yeah, man. Uh, and I don't remember what I shared when we talked about it. I've talked about it a lot. Well, maybe not a lot, but I've talked about it a few times. Um, there's a lot, you know, one, I have to, before I even talk about this, I have to give credit to my wife. Like we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for her. It's not mm -hmm. that I didn't want this. I did, but I was like at the, setting up this business, running this business, coaching my ass off. I didn't have a lot of space to do the planning to get us out here, but I did as best as I could to support, but like we would not be here if it wasn't for my wife. Um, I exposed her to Costa Rica and said, Hey, maybe one day we'll live there. And then it was actually just a, a little over a year ago when we sat down and said, Hey, maybe it's time to, for us to think seriously about moving to Costa Rica. I was like, if we're going to do this, you got to be in charge of it while I run the business. And she's like, cool. Um, I'm like, perfect. So we hired a consultant. So here yes. we are. So shout out to my wife. Um, Jessica, she's an amazing leader and she's yes. the one who got, who physically like is responsible for getting us here. Um, I just say, yes, babe, I will do whatever you tell me to do. And that's, that was my role in this whole process. Um, but yeah, getting here, deciding to move here, I have to say, uh, my daughter is a huge inspiration mm -hmm. for us moving here. You know, if we didn't have her, maybe we would have made this change when we made it. Maybe we would have waited, but me looking at where the world is headed, how the world is turning, what I, what's important to me, what's important to my wife. We started thinking about where we wanted Ayana to grow up mm -hmm. and, you know, it wasn't Palo Alto, California. Um, right. we thought about Oakland Hills cause that's kind of a nice environment, but it wasn't Oakland. We thought about going back to Long Beach cause we love Long Beach but it wasn't Long Beach. Um, so we were like, well, where do we know we want to be eventually? And the answer was always Costa Rica. So we we're like, well, why not now? And we couldn't come up with a single reason that wasn't fear driven, right? Every reason that we came over reasons like, oh, what if, what if our family doesn't reach out to us? What if our friends never come visit? You know, what if this, what if that all fear driven responses? But everything that we know is that we don't want fear to drive our lives. You know, we want our purpose. We want love to drive our lives. And we had a lot of reasons, a lot of love filled reasons to drive, to drive us to Costa Rica. So we got busy, we got planning, we got help. Um, and we started to explore where we might want to live. And then this is where, this is where we landed a year later. So it's, um, it's been a journey, man. It's been a journey, but every day that goes by, we're feeling more and more positive about mm. this being the right move for us um, for right. the foreseeable future. And what's 
living in Costa Rica now, like, give me a, an example of your average day. Um, you know, it's different. It's definitely different. Um, but <laughs> That's it's what also, I have to ask. <laughs> it's very similar, but it's also different. So right now, right now specifically, it's a rainy season. Right? Okay. So it rains like half the year. So this is why the place is so beautiful and luscious right. green. Um, so right now, if you looked out here, you would see a lot of green, but you see gray skies. Um, so because it rains almost every day wow. during the rainy season for like half the day. And so, you know, you you often will wake up to like blue skies, you know, that, you know, th those days when it just rain and the next day it's sunny. You get that a lot here. You know that, you know that, that that's, yeah, that's, that's the oh, best, man. man it's the best. So almost every morning, I won't say every morning, but I would say like 60, 70, sometimes 80% of the week you wake up to blue skies, fresh rain or like freshly rain green. It's out of this world. Um, so for me during the week, I coach. So I wake up, I haven't been exercising cause I'm still in transition. Um, so I'm working on getting back and taking care of my body. I'll wake up, make family coffee, um, or make myself and just coffee, maybe make smoothies, uh, maybe write a little bit, maybe create a little bit, um, and then be with the family, have breakfast, and I get to coach. And I coach for a couple hours, and then maybe take a Yana out for a walk, we'll have lunch, and then maybe take a Yana out for a walk during the day if it's not raining too hard. <laughs> um, and then I coach for a couple more hours, and then we have an early dinner. Um, it gets dark here soon. So it gets dark like around like three, four. Wow. Sometimes. Yeah. It might, you it's might so get some, early. it's super early, man. Um, <laughs> it's super early. So like everything winds down at like three or four o'clock, especially during wow. the rainy season. So our days, but that's kind of how we like our days anyway. You know, we moved here for alignment, right? We felt very aligned to the culture. We're early risers. Everybody rises with the sun here and everybody goes down with the sun. And that's how we're supposed to be. And that's exactly. how we, that's how we like to live our lives. Um, so it fits, it fits. So we will have our early dinner four or five o'clock and then we have family time for the rest of the night. Maybe I'll pop on, answer a couple emails sometimes. Um, maybe Jess will do something, but really like from five to seven before we start getting ready for bed, it's just family time. We don't watch a lot of TV, so we're just chilling together, um, playing with Ayana give her a bath. We all head to bed at the same time and we wake up the next day, do it again. Um, weekends today are a little different because we're, we're in this new area. So mm -hmm. we're doing a lots of exploration. I mean, this place is stunning, my man. Like this place is, it's Can out, imagine. it's out of this world. Um, it's every time I drive down our little highway right here, I feel like I'm in Jurassic Park or something like that. Like, <laughs> it's a trip. It's so green. It's just green everywhere. I lived in Seattle. Seattle's the greenest place I've ever lived. It's like five times more green than Seattle. Wow. It's insane. So it's like just driving around exploring. There's like natural waterfalls everywhere. There's little parks here and there. There's little towns. So we live in one town uh, called Uvita. And then next to Uvita, to the left of Uvita is Ojo Chao, which is where we're thinking about buying land and building a house. And then on the other side of Uvita is Dominical, which is a little like hippie surfer beach town. Um, mm. So we just like go back and forth, checking out food spots, checking out the scenery. We'll drive up dirt roads, check out different views. So we're really, we're doing a lot of exploration right now just to get a feel for what this area has to offer. Cause it's, there's a lot here and it's like, a lot of it is hard to find. Um, right. So it's like, you gotta go, everything is off the beaten path, man. Um, like the road, I'm in a house now. To get to this house is a dirt road. To get to most homes is a dirt road. There's like one highway that's paved. <laughs> it's like you, you turn off the paved road and you're on a dirt road and then it's like adventure. So everything here feels like an adventure for us right now, which is super cool. It's like exactly what we wanted. Uh, that, that's exactly what I want. And I, I feel like more, more people don't, don't experience that. At least in California, I feel like more people do. But I, when you go to the East Coast, you're like, you don't have that, right? Like too much. Mm. Um, mm. Unless you go to like where my mom lives in Georgia. I mean, she has like the forest right behind, right? Like, but like in New York, you know, like that's why I moved to California. Now I'm like, well, now I want to go somewhere like next level. I never, I never been, 
So like, Man. you know, I can't wait to visit you. <laughs> you come through, bro. Come. Look, I'm not playing. I've been telling people we have this house that has a studio casita. So it's like a, you got a bed, you got a kitchenette, you got your bathroom. Um, all, all on free its own? Stay. Free stay, yeah. It's, it's a, separate from the house. So wow. you, wanna, you got, look, what's today? The ninth. We have this place for another month. Check out flights, bro. Come out. We we <laughs> we're happy to have guests. Come stay for a long weekend if you want. We'll we'll be happy to host you, man. Shit, like that sounded very very attractive. <laughs> yeah, as long as you're cool with like it raining almost every day, but getting some sun throughout the week, or maybe may, I mean the thing is like you could come on let's say a Friday, and you might not see the sun all weekend. That's wow. possible. That's that possible. Is, yeah. But it's rare. You'll likely get sun at least one of like three days during this time of the year. So right. just know that. Yeah. Um, I have two more questions and then we'll, we'll close out. But first, I wanted to just get a, like a little. You talked about Ayana, about how she was an inspiration for moving for you. And I think uh, like fatherhood, like being a father, like what that experience is like obviously i i ask this question to every father that's come on the podcast because i want to be a father eventually but i i love to learn from you guys that are doing it in the midst of yeah. it you know yeah. what's that experience like <sighs> well yana is 19 months old now mm -hmm. and this is like i don't know peak parenting so far I I'm having such a good time, man. I I love this little girl so much. It is the most rewarding thing to just to be with her. Mm -hmm. You know, it's tough for me because I coach more than I want. So I'm working on coaching less, but because I would love to spend more time with her. And I say that I'm like, I'm only coaching like three, four hours a day. And I spend the rest <laughs> of my time with my family. Right. So it's like very different from the full time job, but even still, right. like if I could spend like a, one or two more hours with her a day, I would feel really good about that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, co uh, being being a dad is it's the most rewarding leadership role I've ever had. Mm -hmm. um, it seeing her having her look like me is another thing that's kind of a trip. Um, but like looking in her, seeing myself, seeing her grow. Like watching her become herself, um, seeing parts of me in her, seeing parts of Jessica in her, um, seeing her become like this really happy, loving little being is just the biggest, biggest reward. It's more than I bargained for. Um, when she was first born, obviously she was newborn, super tough. We're not sleeping. Now that we're beyond that tough phase and I just get to enjoy her and nurture her, um, it's it's out of this world. It's kind of like being in Costa Rica. It's just like, is this real life? Is you know, real life? like serious, man. Like sometimes Jessica will just be watching her and we're like, can you believe that like this is our daughter? You know, wow. we, like we get to like witness her is it's something special, man. It's something really special. Oh man, did it activate something for you? Like when, you know, she was finally in this world or did yeah. you? Yeah. Um, when she first came, I got this really strong sense of duty. Um, mm. my duty and protector. I, you know, I self identify as like being kind of soft and squishy. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm a lover, not a fighter. Right. But but like when she was born, I, there's some part of me that just started to like puff up a little bit because I just wanted <laughs> to make sure she was safe. But also like everything in my mind was centered around her and taking care of her. Like I just wanted to make sure that she was good. Um, mm. It her presence. That's why I say she was an inspiration. Her presence has inspired me to really like go for it. Right. Mm. Like. I want to be a good model for living a meaningful life for her, right? Like I want to, I want to be very clear that like I went all out, like I did everything I could to make her life amazing, but also fulfill my purpose. Mm -hmm. And, and so every day it's like, how can I help us get closer to wherever we're supposed to be? Um, that's why like when she was born in, 
March 2021. She's 19 months, right? So it's been a year and a half. In that year and a half since she was born, my wife and I have paid off all of our debt. Um, I quit my job. We have moved to Costa Rica. And we have just finished documents to open up escrow to buy land in Costa Rica. Um, so like, we are moving, man. And I Ayana, <laughs> Ayana is the inspiration. She's wow. 100%. It's like I picture her, one, growing up outside. And this is, you know, back to what I was telling you earlier. Like I grew up outside. I grew up playing with plants and bugs. And that changed me that molded mm-hmm. me and there's something really important about being with nature and being comfortable with nature respecting nature and being comfortable with it and so i picture her like in this land that we're gonna buy like playing and going on hikes and just being with nature and like having that kind of experience and doing it in like a contained environment right um but but really exploring mm-hmm. like, that's what i that's what i want for her um, and I know that that will do her good. You know, I know that she she's going to be, be on some other wave that like neither <laughs> Jessica and I really got to be on because we didn't have a two parent loving household to support right. us and na- nurture us while we adventured and while we explored outside. Um, so she's going to be different. Um, we know that we're looking forward to her being different and seeing how different she is. Um, but so much of what we're doing is not just for us. It is for us, right? Like living in Costa Rica is nice. We, we want this for ourselves. We also want this for Ayana. Um, Mm -hmm. she's, she's been a huge inspiration, man. Huge inspiration. That's so beautiful, man. Like, uh, like you're so poetic too. So I always, I always forget to say that. Like my man, Uh Kayvon is a poetic (laughs) Thanks, man. man. Sometimes I just be I just be talking, man, and I be like losing track. I'm like, what am I talking about again? (laughs) And then you say, and then you call me poetic. So I guess it made sense. Uh, (laughs) Um, So last question, obviously, with the the show being called the Pond the Pond the Podcast, one of my last questions I always ask is, uh, what is something that you're pondering about now? Like, what's something that's really, you know taking up a lot of your brain space outside of just work and you know, family. Maybe is it about the world? What's top of mind for you? Yeah. Um, and this is going to be very on brand for me, uh, but, it's, <laughs> but it's the truth. The, the question I'm almost always asking myself is like, what, what is my purpose? Mm-hmm. You know, what is my purpose here? I I move forward and I get closer and it becomes clear, right? Like my purpose was not become a leadership coach. It's not it. It's a channel for something greater. My purpose is not move to Costa Rica, right? That's just a move closer. Purpose is not be a dad. That's a big part of me moving closer to my purpose. I mean, Ayana has been this huge inspiration that has like propelled us forward. Um, I know there's something really big out there for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I can kind of see it. You know, Jess and I are working on it. It has something to do with helping people find freedom and fulfillment. Mm-hmm. And, I, and as we move forward on this path and do it more for ourselves, it becomes clear like how we might support others to do the same. Right. But I, I, I envision a world where everybody can just wake up and spend their days the way that they want and feel the most fulfilled as they want to be, right? They have the freedom to create. They have the freedom to be with their families. They have the freedom to serve others in whatever ways they want to serve. And they can do that as much or as little as they want because they have all their needs met. Um, I envision that for everybody, right? And I'm trying to figure out what exactly is my role. In that I'm, I'm moving towards that and I'm starting to create that with other people. Um, but I don't know how big of a role it is. Some part of me says it, it could be big. That might be my ego. I'm not sure. Um, mm. But I know what I want to see. You know, I want other people to experience what we're experiencing. And I'm trying to figure out, like, what is my purpose in that? 
So that's what I, I think about on the daily. And this is what Jess and I talk about. Like, what is our role in, in this change, this transformation that we want to see in the world? Um, so that's where I'm at. Wow. So it's, it's like, you know, most people listen to this probably be like, okay, Vaughn found his purpose. But like, you're continuously asking that question to yourself, you and Jess together. And figuring out like, it's like a fog and you're like walking through the fog and slowly it's revealing itself as you get closer. Am I, am I getting that right? At least that's the visual. A hundred percent. That's a, I think that's a perfect metaphor, man. That's exactly, that's how it feels to me. Right. Mm. We get closer, like, okay, get to Costa Rica. Boom. We did that. And then it's like, oh, actually there's more, you know, (laughs) it's like the forest just is deeper and deeper. You think, you think you got to the, to the place, but then the forest continues. Um, so we're just continuing to move forward. It's like the second mountain, I guess. You ever read that book, The Second Mountain with David? Brooks? I haven't. I haven't. Uh, I've yeah. heard about it though. Heard about. He talks it. about that where, like, you you know, career wise, you might hit a uh, you know, you hit your peak, and then you get to that peak to realize that there's another peak, and like yeah. his whole thing is like you find your peak in your career, but after that, like the next peak is like your full, fully fleshed out purpose and like what you're supposed to do in this world, and it gets like mm-hmm. very spiritual in that sense. Um, Absolutely, it's a beautiful, beautiful book. Um, yeah, I might yeah. need to check it out. This is it's a spiritual journey, right? Yep. It's a leadership journey. It's a spiritual journey. The two are one and the same. Um, and that's what I think about on the daily. Every day I wake up, it's centered around how can I fulfill my purpose uh, right. to the highest level? And what does that look like? And I'm working on it. I'm working on yeah. it. Aren't we all? Huh? <laughs> Some of us intentionally, unintentionally, consciously, yep. unconsciously, yep. But we're, we're all moving forward. We're all moving exactly. forward. Exactly. Exactly. Well, uh, that's a great question. You just continuously ask yourself, even if this, you know, whoever's listening, does have a purpose. They think they just reach their purpose. It's like, well, what is actually beyond that? Like what's beyond the veil, beyond the fog, beyond the forest that you accomplish beyond the mountain, right? Mm-hmm. It's a great question to continuously keep top of mind. Every day. Keep moving. Every Love day. It. Job's never done. Job's, Job's never, never done. done. Not until you six feet under. And even then it's probably not done if you no, believe no, no, you get to, Yeah, you get to then you get to choose another mission, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's exactly. like what's my next mission? I was cave on, we moved to Costa Rica, we, we changed millions of lives. What do I want to do next? Um that's that's next. We'll see. We'll see when we yeah. get there. Awesome. Well, um thank you again, Kayvon. I mean we, there's so many topics I wanted to touch with you, but obviously, you know, you have a family, you have some family to get back to and it's family time, which is very important to you. And I obviously respect it to the utmost, you know, um, but I really appreciate you coming on. Is there anywhere that folks can find you if you want to be found? If not, that's yeah. totally fine. <laughs> yeah, no, I do want to be found. Um, I, I want to say, you know, we're in the process of building this collective. So one, if you're a coach out there and you're looking to connect with other like spirited folks such as myself, um, hit me up. You can find me at consciously dot O N E that's consciously dot one. Um, you can also find me on Instagram at conscious or consciously underscore cave on. Uh, you can also find me on LinkedIn. Um, just search for K V O N, uh, space T U C K E R cave on Tucker. I do want to be found. We're out here building. We want to, we want to support others to find freedom and fulfillment for themselves and the people around them. So we're on this mission and I want to attract as many like spirited folks as I can. Um, so to you, Ruben, I want to say thank you, my man, for the invitation to share invitation to spread this gospel i suppose (laughs) (laughs) um i would love to do it again i know we could talk about a lot of other things and i'm i love to share so we can find another time and we'll do do a part two that'd that'd be fun for me yes i'd love to do a part two and dig into more of kayvon relationship stuff i think that was like a topic that i just didn't even get to get to (laughs) Um, yeah. that I think you have so many gifts to share there. So well, I appreciate that. I have a lot of perspective. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of perspective. Well, thank you again, my brother. Um, yeah, man. again, I, I can't, I can't be more like thankful for this and, and like grateful for this opportunity, you know, to just have you on and share with the world. Um, 
yeah my, so. my pleasure my pleasure last thing i want to say thank you for is thank you for inspiring me to finally get my camera and my mic set up i've been wanting to do it since i got here and i just was dragging my feet but i was like look Ruben wants me to be on this podcast. We got to come right. So here we are. So you helped came me get right. set up today. <laughs> you came right. You look like a true, like you've been doing podcasting for years. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, man. Appreciate it. Appreciate awesome, it. Awesome, man. Thank you so much. All right, brother. Thank you. All Take right. care. Thank Peace. you. Take care, folks. Peace.